Welcome to Pharmacy View, technology and pharmacy business podcast series, where we provide regular interviews with pharmacists and key industry people within the Australian pharmacy and associated industry. In each podcast, we look to discuss aspects of pharmacy operation and how technology is improving or interacting with each guest's current role or pharmacy-related business. I'm your host, Scott Carpenter, and today's guest is sponsored by Shopfront Solutions, leading the way in digital marketing and communications, providing a cloud-based platform for pharmacies to manage all of their digital messaging and print-based collateral. For more information on the Shopfront Solutions digital platform, simply go to the website at shopfrontsolutions.com.au. I'm talking today with pharmacist Michael Alexander, who I had the pleasure to meet and work with several years ago when we were both part of the Terry White Chemist team. Welcome, Michael. Hi, Scott. Great to be here. Absolutely. Uh, it was great to stay connected. And, and look, obviously, we've been able to stay connected through uh, the wonders of technology and social media platforms. And the reason that I reached out to you is because I saw in one of your recent LinkedIn posts that your current business role includes the use of AI technology. And this really intrigued me. Um, and obviously, it just ties in nicely. You're a pharmacist and you're using AI technology. So I thought it would be good if we were to chat. But before we get into, I guess, that area in a bit more depth, for our valued uh, listeners today, um, who you know, many of you, many may know you, but for those that don't, uh, who is Michael Alexander? Sure, absolutely. So hi to all your Aussie listeners and listeners around the world. Uh, Let's start by saying that even though I spent over 20 years of my life in Australia, I was not able to shake my Yankee accent. Uh, So apologies for that. Uh, But uh, I do consider myself an Aussie. I've lived over half my life in Australia. Uh, But I grew up in Los Angeles, California, and I moved to Australia as a teenager. Um, Received my pharmacy degree from the University of Queensland way back in 1998. Uh, I, yep. uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, when you say it like that, it's, it feels like a long time. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, hey, I'm still trying to remember the eighties when you were born. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> it's a great decades, great decades, uh, for sure. That's it. Uh, so, uh, I, I worked, uh, in the industry for many years. I ended up buying into my first pharmacy back in 2005, which was a small Amcal pharmacy in the Eastern suburbs of Melbourne. Uh, I exited that business a few years later, worked as a locum for a few years, and then eventually in 2012, I was one of the founding members of a pharmacy group that had a number of pharmacies across Sydney, Brisbane, and Adelaide. Uh, I also ended up yep. co-owning uh, three Terry White chemists and a Priceline, and that's when you and I met, Scott. Uh, yep. Yep. Um, about the same time, I achieved uh, my master's of management, and my MBA from Macquarie University. Uh, but then in 2014, yep. I decided to exit community pharmacy and ultimately the country. Uh, I did some contract work in Dubai as a retail consultant and then spent some time at CVS Health, which is the largest retail pharmacy chain in the United States, and Blue Cross Blue yep. Shield, the largest health insurer in the United States, uh, doing product development, particularly in digital and telehealth based products. And then a few years ago, I founded an online communication startup called Audrey uh, with a good friend of mine, uh, Peter Ecladios, who is based in Sydney. And I am currently Mm -hmm. CEO of Audrey. Excellent. And I think from one of our um, off-the-side conversations, it's your uh, plan or desire to get back here to Australia at some stage because some of your family are still here? Yeah. um, All my immediate family is still in Australia, um, in the Brisbane area, and I have a lot of family and friends there. So... Uh, I would absolutely love to get there as soon as, uh, you know, we can get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm listening to the news here this morning, and I guess today's date is the uh, 11th of October for this recording. Um, new South Wales' uh, new uh, Premier announced this morning that uh, they're actually pushing to get um, Australian residents, um, Australian passport residents with double vaccination from you know, starting to fly in from the 1st of uh, November. So that's actually not too far away. Yeah, only so, a few weeks. Great news. Great news. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the challenge is still the interstate borders because Queensland's still close to New South Wales. But um, I'm sure by the time we get all that sorted, it'll be worked out for sure. Fingers but, crossed. So... Uh, so on that basis, and, and again, as I said, I, I certainly had the pleasure to get to know you over, over, whilst it was only a short period of time. I think it was a quality period of time, and, and it's been great to stay connected. But uh, obviously, you've had the advantage of working in both um, Australian pharmacy and now the US pharmacy. Is there uh, what, what are the pros and cons, I guess? Not, not that we're going to say anything too bad, but, but there's some things that Australia will do well, and there'll be some things that uh, the US do very well. So what, what do they look like? 
Yeah, it's a great question. It's not, and it's a question I get a lot from my um, Aussie counterparts. You know, what, what's the difference? What, what What's available in U.S.-based community pharmacy that's not available in Australia? And um, having worked at CVL, CVS Health, you know, um, I, I have a, a good kind of feeling for the differences. And, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what innovations are here that might be adopted yep. in Australia. And, um, you know, as a learning experience, I'm not here to sort of say one is better than the other. I see, like you said, there's no, no. positives and negatives uh, in both areas, yep. but there's definitely um, things we can learn and adopt, um, particularly from the yep. U.S.-based types of procedures. So, I mean, you talk about CVS Health, they have 5,000 pharmacists working for them across 10,000 retail pharmacies. You know, the scale is enormous, mm. and you would think yep. that the, te- the level of technological innovation is much higher than Australian community pharmacy, uh, but it's just not true. You know, that's the big secret. Okay. You know, there's no real cutting edge technology here that's not available in Australia. I think the the way, the way difference is, is how CVS and Walgreens and Rite Aid, um, how they deploy that technology. You know, they do yeah. it in ways that Australian pharmacy hasn't really started to dive into for multiple, multiple reasons, but um, I think there, there's some real learning experiences there about what they're doing. Yeah. You know? and, I, and I guess, Michael, to, just so not, not to try to interrupt you too much, but I guess um, I did have the uh, opportunity to go over to the US a couple of years ago with a, uh, a colleague from Terry White, and, and we visited um, a few of the pharmacy chains in on the East Coast. And um, I, I, look, accepting that I didn't get out into all of the suburbs, but I guess I was exposed to the brands, which are, which are now the CVS brands, which tended to be very, very cookie cutter in, in my view. Mm-hmm. And I know to a point we've got that in Australia as well, but we seem to have a whole lot of cookie machines. Whereas, is it fair or unfair to say that the, the US probably has less cookie machines? I think it's totally fair. I think it's totally fair because in yeah. the US, we've had a lot of, uh, you know, um, integration, you know, lots of big chains buying up smaller pharmacies. So you have a lot of that yes. sameness across the chain. So you, yeah. they, you go into a CVS, kind of looks like a Walgreens, that kind of looks like a Rite Aid. And really that that is one of the negative aspects, right? You, you don't get the yeah. difference and the diverse opinions and diverse looks that in community pharmacy that you do in Australia. Uh, and, but what yeah. you do get is efficiencies in scale, you know, particularly in yes. technology. And you get a an efficiency where the outreach to uh, patients is scaled up to a way that I think we can learn from in, in Australian community pharmacy. Yeah. You know, they're, CVS, for example, uh, they do a lot of outreach to their uh, patients around a multitude of different things. And, you know, I worked in a program called New Script Pickup, where a patient comes in yeah. and they, they put in a prescription for a new product or a new prescription yeah. or a new medication, and then they just and they leave and they don't come back. So what do you do? In yeah. that circumstance, yeah. in Australian pharmacy, there might be an outreach, one or two outreaches, maybe a phone call before it's put back in stock. In American pharmacy, there are multiple outreaches across different types of modalities, digital outreach, SMS outreach, calls from the pharmacists and the techs. They have call queues within their dispensary software that automatically get populated with uh, this, these types of medications that or prescriptions that patients don't come back for. Uh, so there is these yeah. multiple outreaches across you know, many, many days uh, in, a, in an effort to connect to the patient and you know, have a communi- have a conversation about their medication. And you may say, okay. and some may say, look, that that's overkill, right? That is a lot of outreach and patients don't like that, but they actually do. You know, they really like okay. being outreach to because it gives them an opportunity to talk to a pharmacist, you know, allay their concerns. You know, they may not pick up the new medication because, you know, they're unsure if they need to take it or they're un- unsure of an interaction between their current medication. Yeah. Or maybe they just can't get to the pharmacy. Yeah. You know, there's a reason why they can't get there. So we don't know that unless we actually connect with the patient. And I think that is the real patient. key, right, is, is the ability yeah. to connect and have that conversation. Yeah, and and I guess on that note too, if I if I took the Australian um, view on that as well, um, you know, there's quite a few script ready programs on the market here in Australia now. Some some are um, available through the guild, some of them are uh, available through the brands. They all generally tend to do the same thing. But if I can again, the the difference between um, 
uh, a a big brand, I'm assuming, like CVS, is that there's a system and routine that people, when they walk that work there, have to do this follow up, you know, and there'll be um, KPIs and parameters around doing or not doing that. Um, whereas here in Australia, you know, you've got a lot of independent owners who that's just one of the things that they've got to do because they're still to kind of do all the reconciliations, do the PBS reconciliation, do the banking, pay the wages, all that kind of thing. So, so I guess you know, the difference between the two would be that. So there's that economies of scale again. Again, pharmacists working in the, in the big chains would be just there to dispense and follow up the customers with some admin tasks, whereas your Australian pharmacists and, and yourself when you were here, you know, you used to have a lot of business admin requirements as well. Um, 100%. Would, would that be a fair uh, analogy? Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. And, 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 and you're right. absolutely right. Yeah. You know, where American pharmacy really uh, ex excels in, is in the timing and measuring of everything. All right. And combining yeah. that with consistent and I would say persistent outreach to the patient. Yeah. And one of the reasons they can do that is because a lot of that admin is taken off their plate. So pharmacists can can do the calls and they can fill the prescriptions and they can talk to the, the doctors and they won't they don't have to go yeah. at the end and, and, and like write up a schedule for the next couple of weeks. Like I used to do after hours because that's the only time I had it. Yeah. I had it to do that. So there is that ability to achieve efficiencies, but it's not something that community pharmacists in Australia can't do or can't start to do. Mm. Um, and I think that's yeah. that's the real key. You know, there's uh, the tech is there. It's just the ability of saying, okay, I'm going to carve out time to do this. I'm going to be very yep. focused and intentional about reaching out to patients who have left their prescriptions at the pharmacy on a regular type of cadence, right? And then that yep. way, you know, you, you can start to see the benefits come through. Like, oh, the, uh, my, my patients really like this and they like being reached out to multiple times. And I, I'm starting to get insights that I didn't have when I didn't do this. And then if you start to do that, you can start to carve out time to adopt other types of programs like that. Yeah, and, and I would... would... Guess too, from a point, if, if a medical professional is, is trying to reach out to me, you're probably going to take a, a little bit more credence to that than if it was someone trying to sell you something or asking for a donation, which is often the calls that we get. So, you know, it's your pharmacy, it's where you've dropped your script in. And I know we did discuss this once before, but, um, you know, on the basis that there's not necessarily this repetitive harassment, because if a, if a client or a customer answers after the first prompt, then you're not going to bother them again until probably a month later. Exactly. You know, if it's, it, it, yeah, then they might, they may not respond first, but then they might respond on the second time. So, so again, it's not like you're contacting all of them 10 times in a month. Yeah, you know, sometimes it might be one, sometimes twice, and sometimes three times. And again, I, I think the 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 fact that you're you know interested in their health and, and well being, to a point, um, I think has a has a bit of a di um, difference. Now mm -hmm. there might be some that you'll never hear from, but I guess there's a point in time where you say, well, you know what, I've I've harassed that person. Um, away effectively, so I'll just I'll park that one now. Yeah, exactly. And there's a difference in messaging and tone between Mrs. Jones, pick up your script, pick up your script, pick up your script, versus uh, Mrs. Yeah. Jones, this is your pharmacist. You haven't picked up your prescription yeah. in a few days. Uh, we're worried about you. We feel like you need to take this medication. Your doctor has prescribed it. Can you please contact the pharmacy and we can have a conversation about it? Yeah, and and, and look, obviously, uh, you'd be aware that you know pharmacies in Australia are currently um, vaccinating the arms off you know, hundreds of thousands yeah. of um, of Australians. So it's potentially not a, the biggest priority at the moment to to chase things up. But again, this is where you can delegate that at least you know the prompts to to the rest of your team because um, you know a lot of the eastern seaboard of Australia has been you know, in shutdown and lockdown where you you're not going in for your, your regular shop. So so you you the rest of your, your dispensary. Team Technicians or your senior pharmacy assistants could actually take that list as well and, and potentially prompt those calls, couldn't they? Absolutely. And I think it's important to note that we make time for things that we feel are important for the health and well-being of our patients. Uh, if we really yeah. feel this type of outreach is important, we'll make time for it. And the great yeah. thing is when we talk about technology is that we can leverage technology to create efficiencies to give us the time to do this sort of patient outreach. Uh, and I think if we're able to do that, um, it's going to bode well for the future, not only for the bottom line, but for that continued communication, continued conversation with our patients. That's the real key. Patients. Yeah. Okay. So if we, if we said 
that potentially the technology platforms are close to par at the moment between Australia and the US. And and we say the significant difference is that, you know, you've got a, a, a 5,000 strong pharmacy group um, in the US and you've got 5,000 plus pharmacies here who are across, you know, independently owned and across multiple brands. Um, is, is there a point of difference then, do you see, between being an independent owner, irrespective of what the brand is on the door, versus just being an employed pharmacist, or, or do you think that it's the same? There is a, there is a difference, uh, I believe, but I think overall the aim is the same. Whether you're part of a yeah. big box conglomerate, whether you work in a discount warehouse pharmacy or community pharmacy that's individually owned, everybody wants to do the best thing for their patients. Everyone wants to take care yes. of their patients in the best way that they can. So overall, the aim is the same. Is how you get there a little bit different? Yeah, it is. But I'm a real passionate believer, and I've thought about this a lot, uh, that community pharmacy is just starting to leverage uh, technology in a way to create a competitive advantage, particularly against yes. uh, the big discount warehouse pharmacies. You know, there is an opportunity... Yep to leverage uh, different platforms, different technologies to create an area that, uh, you know, if you look at management, you call it management uh, strategy, like blue ocean strategy, you know, create a blue ocean where you can go and start to do things that your competitors aren't doing versus the red ocean where there are a lot of sharks that are just feeding. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. when you talk about like lower prices, well, that game has been won by the warehouse pharmacies yeah. uh the mar marketing and marketing reach that game's been won uh to a point yeah. but the great thing about leveraging technology is you don't need a huge amount of resources to do it uh, you know as a yeah. small community pharmacy individually owned you have access to pretty much the same technologies that a cvs health does right but it's yes. a matter of are you focused? Uh, are you thinking? Are you putting technology at the center of all you do? That's a real paradigm shift in thinking. Uh, and because right now yeah. I, we're just we're thinking of technology as just ancillary to the core business of pharmacy. You know, and that should change. That the first questions yeah. any pharmacy owner should be asking themselves today is, what technology can I use to make this process better, or this system more efficient, or allow me to provide a better patient experience? That is the first question you need to ask yourself. And then you can start yes. to, to define what that means for you and start to outreach um, to patients accordingly. But that window is closing. You know, I, I think now what's happening is the, the big box warehouse pharmacies are starting to understand how to leverage technology better to be more patient focused. Yes. So if we don't get in the game and create that competitive advantage, it's going to pass us by. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and again, look, I, I think here in Australia, we've, we've possibly still got a couple of years of the, of the chemist discounting impacting the industry, um, mainly because of the marketing reach of them. Um, and and the geographic distance of some of our pharmacies. But having said that, certainly one of the things that I've noticed in recent times is, um, you know, the discounters uh, used to tend to run on a very lean staff, and that was, you know, they get their costs down, get their margins down right. um, to, to still maintain a profitable business. But the volumes of those discounters have actually gone up so much that I know that the last couple of times I've gone into a, a discounter here in Australia, um, there's been people, there's been team members on the floor. Now, they might have been filling the shelves because the volume demands hmm. that the shelves have to be refilled. Right. But they've obviously changed their mantra because if you stop and ask one of them, can they help you or can they point you in the right direction? You know, as a rule, they'll take you to the spot. They won't just point. So that, that discount mentality around the pricing has changed because obviously the volume now allows them to have enough people on the floor to still offer that service as well. Now, um, the reciprocal side of that is that, you know, my actual pharmacist, um, I drive past 30 other pharmacies I've worked out to get to my pharmacist because I've developed a relationship with that pharmacist. Um, that pharmacy offers a, a, a different kind of service. They're, they're part of a buying group, but they're not part of a brand. They're their own brand. Um, and their focus is certainly on on my health, which is what I guess got my attention. Uh, you know, they're, they're not necessarily trying to sell me a whole lot of other products. Um, that has come over time because of my age um, and I guess where my body's at in life. <laughs> but, but having said that, you know, I'm on two products, sometimes three at the moment at best um, because of, I guess, their guidance and advice in conjunction with my doctor. So again, there's that point of difference where price isn't necessarily the driving factor. As I said, I drive past 30 other pharmacies to go to this particular one, and I know 
know that may be unique to me, but I suspect it's not because um, one of the other things that I've learned over time with pharmacies and particularly in the um, towns and suburbs is that they're generational. So right. grandmother's been there, mother's been there, daughter's been there, granddaughter's been there. And and I say the the feminine side of that because, let's face it, you know, men are not great pharmacy shoppers. We go there as a rule when we have to. And, and, and to a point, I guess that's changing, but it but it is the rule. So so um, I certainly remember some pharmacies that I were involved with, with a, where, again, you know, granddaughters uh, or, or daughters were bringing their children past 50 other pharmacies because they were coming back to their family pharmacy. So there's that mm -hmm. unique point of difference, which, if I've heard you right, is saying that pharmacy needs to be careful that they don't become redundant by not embracing technology what's happening now because they could then lose that generational um, status couldn't they they absolutely can and i think you bring up an excellent point about the way community pharmacies can survive and thrive in the age of discounters using technology and that's through yep. patient-centered solutions patient-centered yep. tech solutions because uh, what you're saying happen is happening all over uh, the country, but you're right. We can't take this for granted because we love to say that as community pharmacies, we you know we are focused on customer service. We know our customer back to front. Uh, you know we deliver holistic healthcare to our patients. Uh, but do we really know our customer? Is my question to you and your listeners. Right, because we love to say it. We yeah. love to say nobody knows my my patient <laughs> like me. I know their name. I know their kids, their grandkids. I know what medications they're taking. I know yeah. what they're doing on the weekend. But there is another level that we need to get to in terms of really understanding our patients. Because do we know when they've missed a yeah. doctor's appointment, for example? Do we know when their doses have changed if we don't if we're not filling a new prescription? Right? Do we even yeah. do we know about their mental health and well being just overall? Do we really have a yeah. holistic idea of our customer? And the only way we can get this information, in my opinion, is to have a, a regular, consistent, detailed communication with our patients. You know, seeing them once a month yeah. or even once a week is not going to cut it. Yeah. You know, because that's not going to create a no. competitive advantage to the warehouse pharmacies. No, because they, they, those those regular visitations again, they kind of almost fit into that cookie cutter process, aren't they? Script in dispense, have a quick chat, go, because you've got another 10 patients, customers, they're lined up ready to go. But but you're saying use the technology to identify the value of each customer, potentially. Yeah, absolutely, because we do get into this habit of, oh, hi, hi, Mr. Smith, great to see you. How's the kids? Okay, see you later, see you next week. Uh, we're not really yeah. getting, we're communicating, but we're not building valuable insights into Mr. Smith's yeah. behavior and what his real needs. Uh, and we need to do that. And the only way we do that, we can't, it's hard to do that when you're trying to fill 500, 600, 700 prescriptions a day and you know, you're running around. That's where the technology yeah. comes in is to create other platforms yeah. you know, to have that conversation. And the great part about it is it's not new technology. You don't have to be super innovative and cutting edge, although you can be. And that, that could be great for you. And I, I don't say I, I yeah. want to tell you not to do that, but you can leverage technology tech that's been around for years, even decades, that I don't think is yeah. leveraged uh, in community pharmacy enough to create that conversation with our patients. Patients, yeah. And look, certainly, um, I still obviously talk to quite a few pharmacists around Australia. And uh, if I got a sense or a feeling of their view at the moment is that there's potentially too many platforms thrown at them at the moment and how do I choose which one is right for my pharmacy? And uh, one of the previous uh, uh, podcast episodes I did with Rob Zarr was, it was actually along the lines of that is that, you know, don't discount any of them, but you'll get a, you'll get a feeling pretty quickly that it's right for you and your team or it's not. So find the ones that actually sit comfortably with you and your team, embrace them and use them as your point of difference is what we're saying, isn't it? Yeah, a hundred percent agree. And um, I heard uh, the podcast with Robert and I really like some of the things he's doing, you know, for example, he's using bots uh, to have that sort mm -hmm. of conversation with his uh, patients and patients can, can reach out to that bot 24 seven, leave, leave comments, yep. leave questions. And then, you know, when, if it's the middle of the night, you can come back the next day and answer and answer that patient. Technology like that is really simple to implement, it's much simpler than it sounds. Mm -hmm. It's very low cost, but 
it's platforms like that that are easy to use, low cost, uh, but if you start to really invest in them and, and start to think through them, can provide immense value to uh, yeah. to your customer base. So, uh, you know, these are the sort of things. And like I said, it doesn't have to be brand new technology, right? Because there are, like, there are some perils in adopting new platforms. So caveat, little asterisk, you know, I'll give you, the, I'll give you <laughs> yeah. an example. Uh, back in 2009, 2010, I went to the Fred offices in Melbourne because I was just yes. interested to know, you know, what are they doing and what's new in, in their software base and things they're working on. And they were super excited about a solution that they built into a Windows phone. So if you, yep. I don't know if you've ever seen a Windows phone. I haven't seen one since that day at the Fred offices. But they were, it was the idea was that this Windows phone was going to supersede uh, Apple, iOS, and Android and become the platform of choice. <laughs> now, obviously, that yeah. didn't happen, right? And and I'm yes. not digging the Fred people because they were trying to be cutting edge. They were trying to yes. see to look into the future and see what the next technology will be. And if you are cutting edge, there's an opportunity to generate tremendous value before other people catch up to you. Uh, you know, for example, example telehealth. You know, telehealth was something that yep. people struggled with for years. It was very niche. You know, like, oh, I'm going to see yes. my doctor uh, online, uh, video calls. Oh, I don't want to do that. Uh, and companies yeah. that got in early really struggled. But then guess what, right? Yeah. There was this pandemic and things changed and now they're riding mm. high. But it was going to happen anyway, right? And now they've generated yeah. a tremendous amount of value. So the idea is, you know, what's the next telehealth? What is that next technology yeah. uh, that you can leverage? And it, it's not that hard to find because there are, there are startups out there that are desperate to partner with businesses. And you've had a few on your yes. podcast that are really yeah. cutting edge and really clever. Uh, and they're desperate to prove out their concepts uh, in the real world. So go and talk to them. Reach out to them. And try mm. a few. Right? It's an iterative process. Yeah. See what th Throw things against the wall. See what sticks. But you don't have to be that cutting edge. It's great if you are, but you don't have to because there's a lot of technology out there that – has been available that you can use uh, that'll give you the insights that you're looking for. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Michael, I'm just uh, cognizant of the time and uh, we could, could chat for a lot longer, but I think we're going to have some regular chats. Yeah. But uh, I guess let's move on to Audrey, um, which is your current uh, role in business. Sure. And I understood that uh, you've got some interaction into pharmacy with this uh, as well. So talk to us a bit about Audrey. Yeah, sure. So Audrey came about, uh, For first of all, we... Audrey is, in a sentence, is a online platform that is trying to help the world communicate better. Right? It's a yeah. very, very broad mission that we've taken on. But the idea came out of my time doing a Toastmasters. And, and I, I believe Toastmasters, there's a number of chapters in Australia. But basically, yes. yeah, it's, it's a professional organization where you go somewhere once or twice a week and you practice your public speaking uh, with a group of people. And I enjoyed the experience, but I was frustrated that I wasn't able to practice speaking skills or communication skills on a regular basis in the comfort of my own home, you know, in my own time. Yeah. And this was pre-pandemic. Obviously, once the pandemic hit, you couldn't do that anyway. So yeah. I talked to Peter, my co-founder, and said, uh, and he's been working uh, for over 25 years in tech and was a leader at IBM. And I asked him a simple question. I said, is there a way we can democratize communication coaching, right? Make it accessible to mm -hmm. everyone 24-7, give objective feedback, price it at a cost that users can can you can uh, you know meets the user where they are? Uh, so yes. we spent a couple years in development. Started in, in 2019. It was good timing, as it turns out, because 2020 we all know what happened, uh, and we were able to mm -hmm. launch our uh, MVP or minimum viable product earlier this year. Uh, and uh, our first product is uh, something called Voice, which is an all-new framework that uses an, an in-depth assessment to build a communication profile for each user. Okay. Uh, so voice is an acronym that stands for visionary, organic, informer, coach, and entertainer, the five major paradigms of communication in our mind. Uh, yes. And yep. so we use, uh, you know, we use research that's been around for decades to create a assessment, a questionnaire, a couple of speaking samples, all run by AI uh, to determine what your strengths and weaknesses are as a communicator and what kind of innate communicator you are, because Scott, the way you communicate is very different from the way I communicate, I bet. If we yeah. did the assessment, yeah. we come up with very different profiles. So it's important that I know how you communicate so I can communicate at this on the same level or at least understand how I can get my message across to you and vice versa. Otherwise, you know, we're kind of talking yeah. over each other or around each other because we just don't understand our communication styles. So that was important. So, so 
Yeah. So, so if I say that back to you, you know, and again, obviously I've done presentation training and I've, I've stood between, you know, some, some one on one, um, sorry, I've participated in some one on one presentations, uh, through to, to major group presentations. So I guess that's come, my confidence has come with age somewhat. Yeah. And, and also with age comes knowledge and the ability to kind of pull information from many, many years of, of exposure to different things. But what you're saying here is that for someone new or for someone that's looking to build their confidence, this is a, a technology platform that allows uh, me to present, I guess, into a screen, not, sim not dissimilar to what we're doing today, and have the AI technology then um, uh, type me, type typeset me and my style, and also then give um, coaching back to me in terms of how I might be able to improve or how I might be able to present in different environments. So that, that's what you're saying. Exactly, exactly right. So, you know, yeah. part of it is understanding the type of communicator you are, but then using that information to provide you feedback. And this is objective feedback yeah. via our AI. It's not somebody listening to you yeah. thinking, saying, oh, I think you can do better here or there. We, you know, we assess you over 30 different uh, delivery and behavioral dimensions. So we assess the, the way okay. you speak and also how you're coming across. Yeah. Like, you know, at the moment, Scott, are you coming across as trustworthy or genuine or sincere? I think you are. I hope your listeners agree, but our <laughs> AI will, will tell you objectively uh, based on yeah. uh, you know the AI learning algorithm we developed and a whole range of research yeah. if, if the AI thinks that that is actually true. Uh, and that's super important. Yeah, you know, if you're going for a job, you know, we have a job yeah. interview prep product. Uh, that's that's important to if to know how you're coming across. Yeah. If you're giving a presentation, it's very important to know how you're coming across. So that's the type of thing we do. Yeah. And and look, it's it's a really important point. And the reason that I guess I was smiling through <laughs> that was that um, again. With age comes wisdom, with grey hair comes wisdom. But these days, my you know friends and colleagues know if I'm asking them for some feedback some, on something that's from me, you know, excuse the expression, but don't bullshit me. Basically, <laughs> um, you know, tell me what you're hearing, not what you think I want to hear. Now, again. Um, you know, that wasn't me 10 years ago, right. but it is certainly me today because I don't want to know how good it sounds. I want to know what I can do better. I want to know what points I'm missing. And, and I love, I love the idea of this technology because ultimately it's, it's, it's objective. It, it's not a friend of mine. It's not a personality um, type as such, but it's actually going to, as you said, based on the algorithms, give me some really good feedback from its perspective. Now, I, I guess I can still choose to, to like, use, amend, accordingly but at least you're hearing something very objective is what i think i've understood exactly right and, and you know it's it's funny because yeah you have the wisdom of age so you want to hear the unfiltered <laughs> feedback but for someone else yeah. uh, that might be really upsetting to them right or we may yeah. think, you know as human beings we want to be positive so we even if we don't think it's very good we'll say it's good so we don't want to you know, make that person upset. So it sometimes it's good to have yeah. that objective feedback. Uh, and you know, we're really passionate about not only helping people communicate who are native English speakers, but people who speak English as a second language. There's a lot of challenges in doing that too. So you know, we partner with organizations that use our product to help refugees, for example, polish their interview skills um, from other countries and yeah. find employment in Australia. Uh, so you know, it's. It's also a matter of building that confidence, but in a way that gives somebody an obje you know, objective feedback that they can use to get better versus just, oh, I think better. you did a good job when you really didn't. Yeah. And, and I think you mentioned to me once before, you, you've actually got a few clients uh, within Australia already using this. But <clears throat> as we've been talking, I guess I can see the opportunity for this, not only from a, a pharmacist who's working long days, trying to get all of their admin done as well as, as looking after their customers, um, doesn't necessarily, they, they look forward to going to events to get the interaction with other pharmacists. But again, this is not necessarily something that's dealt with at that arena. So if you've got a pharmacist in a remote location, or you've got a pharmacist in a very busy pharmacy that just doesn't get the time, this could be a good opportunity for them. Um, I guess I also see the opportunity within supplier base because you know, a lot of suppliers and, and a lot of sales um, based suppliers will do will spend a lot of time and, and resource in terms of sales coaching and training. But again, it's it's generally one person's view. So I know that the coaching that I've done is based on my history and my knowledge. But, you know, if if I talk to anyone today, I'll, it'll off, the question will obviously be, no, no, what's happening today? Not what happened when I was there. Tell me what's actually happening today. So, again, these algorithms could actually be very current from that perspective, I would imagine. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the way I see it for community pharmacy is you know, to, for our, our product is 
a couple different use cases. For example, when it comes to recruiting, you, you want to recruit for your team, whether it's a, a pharmacy or multiple pharmacies. How does your team communicate? Do you, do you have deep insight yeah. into that? What kind of communicator would best be suited to join your team? You know, maybe your team is very detail oriented, what we call the informer paradigm. You know, they're very detail oriented, but they don't have a lot of people who are visionaries, who really speak at a high level, who can paint a vision of the future for the business. Maybe you want someone like that on board. I mean, we'll be able to tell you the dynamics yeah. uh, in your team and who potentially might be a good addition to the team. So that's important. And like you said, we can, we can help train we can help train pharmacists to communicate better, right? Pharmacists are generally introverted, eh, you know. We kind of know that, yep. right? But we can help build their confidence, communicate at a higher level. That's going to help them. It's going to help uh, the people, uh, their customers, and the people they work with. So, like you said, it's not one person making these decisions. It's you know leveraging AI in a way. And you know, algorithm is a is a scary word sometimes. Oh, I don't want an algorithm to decide. But all that means is it's data that we've all we've collected and put in to yeah. create a tool that can help people do things a little bit better, a little more efficiently, and give people insights uh, that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, that's all it is. Otherwise, yeah. So, Michael, we've probably come to the end of our time. And again, if I'm if I'm true to form, I try and keep these <laughs> around the half hour limit because I, I, I want people you know, to have a, a time frame to listen to this in. Um, but I think in the scheme of things, we will uh, catch up again and, and talk about this a little bit further. But um, we'll include the links to your LinkedIn profile and to your Ordery webpage. So at least people will be able to go there and have a look. Um, but I think at the end of the day, this has been really great to chat. I'm, I'm so pleased we've been able to reconnect from afar. And uh, hopefully when you do get to uh, fly back into Australia, if I'm uh, in Sydney or, uh, or in Brisbane, it'd be great to catch up again face to face. Thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Today. Absolutely. We'll do. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening today. Pharmacy View is a technology-focused podcast provided by Melbourne-based business Arian Technologies and Shopfront Solutions. Over the podcast series, our guests include pharmacists, retail managers, wholesalers, suppliers, and industry technology partners. If you would like further information on our podcast series or to participate in one of our episodes, feel free to send me a message or touch base through the Pharmacy View website, pharmacyview.com.au. 